Praise the Lord. Good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Amen. Good to see everybody out with us tonight and uh, just happy to, happy to be here with you. Uh, we're going to continue on in our study and if y'all will, let's go ahead and turn to Galatians. This is where we had been coming out of for a pretty good while and we're going to go back to that just for a moment here and uh, see where the Lord would take us from there. But Galatians chapter 5, you all probably remember this verse, Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start 13th verse and the 14th also. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen? Amen. If y'all will, let's go ahead and stand and we'll open with prayer real quick and uh, get into the study. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness, Lord, for your tender mercies. Lord, we thank you for the revelation that you've given to us, Lord, for this word that you have given unto us. Lord, that you have preserved your word all these years, Lord, to, to ha- so that we might have it today. And Father, we just ask that you would go before us tonight, Lord, that you would teach us your word, that you would reveal yourself to us more and more. Lord, that we might see more clearly that which you desire for us to see. And Lord, that you would help us to walk close, Lord, that you would help us just to reach out our hands by faith and walk with you, Lord, and talk with you. And Lord, to enjoy the fellowship that we have with you because of the blood of Jesus. And Father, we just want to pray right now for all those who are unable to make it tonight, Lord, for all those who are on the road traveling, for all those that are out, Lord, for all those that have turned away and went another direction, Father, we just ask that you pray and touch every need right now. Lord, that you would continue to give this church the spirit of intercession as we seek the uh, the, the problems that others have, Lord, to bring them before you and, and seek to uh, pray for them on their, to, to you on their behalf, Lord, and to seek your face, Lord, for all that we have to deal with, to seek your face, Lord, for all that you have laid before us with the radio station and for this church and for the direction that you want us to go, Lord, that we would constantly be found looking for your direction. Lord, that we would constantly be found, Lord, in your word, desiring to find the answer within the pages of the Holy Scriptures. And Father, we just ask that you have your way, Lord. Have your way in our hearts and our lives. Have your way in our thoughts and our minds. And Lord, teach us more and more each day to walk close unto you. And we ask and pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said, as we continue in this, this is where we left off uh, some weeks ago. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. And we'll just begin right there. This is dealing with uh, when we got saved. This is the beginning of our days. From the time that we saw Jesus, from the time that we saw the cross as not just an object, but we saw Jesus and the way he stretched out his arms and gave a love offering. He gave himself to be a love offering for us. And when we saw that and Likewise, we said this today in the radio program, but, but he even gave us the instructions on how to get saved by laying down his life. When he gave his life for us, he taught us how to get saved, to give our lives unto him, that we first be servants of God and then of men. Amen? So this is the liberty that's being spoken of, that what Jesus died that we might have, that we might have liberty, Amen? And not slavery. And it says, though, that once we come into this great salvation walk, that we have a decision that is to be made. And that's going to be, number one, we either choose to use that liberty as an occasion to the flesh, or the other side is that we, by love, serve one another. Upon salvation, this is the decision that has to be made. And if you will notice, uh, these two opposite decisions, one decision, the uh, occasion of the flesh, is selfishness, to walk selfishly, to maintain a selfish perception. 
okay? Because that's what, that's what we had to come away from to get saved. To start in this newness of life, we had to walk, whether we realize it or not, even if it was only for a minute, even if it was just for the time that we saw the way that Christ gave his life because he loved us. And in return, we laid down our life and said, I give you my life. Even if it was only for a moment and from the time that we said yes to Jesus, when we stood back up, if we're not taught by that work of the cross, if we're not taught by that expression of God's love, and we stand up, we continue in the same selfish pattern that has caused all of our heartache, all of our hurt, all of our problems, and we continue in the same thing and wonder why things are not different. But the opposite side of this is by love, serve one another. And this is the selfless perception. Occasion to the flesh, selfish. By love, serve one another, selfless. By love, serve one another, the image and likeness of God. Occasion of the flesh, image and likeness of Satan. The, the satanic nature to rebel against uh, God being the highest priority and making ourselves be the highest priority. That's what it is. That's what the flesh is. Uh, I, I, I'm... <laughs> The more we're hearing this, the, it, the, the word flesh becomes a generic term. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we need to try to get another microphone here. Preston. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, go, go ahead, and we'll catch it right when you get back. Uh, but, but the word flesh and what, it's, it's almost as if that's being used, that word's being used as a scapegoat. We're just going to say that's just the flesh uh, as if there's not, a, uh, a way around it, if it's just something that's inevitable and we're not going to be able to deal with. But that flesh that we have to deal with, uh, that is the nature of sin, which is selfishness. That's the default position. If you have, uh, I'm trying to think of something as an example, but um, if you have a push-button switch, a lot of times those push-button switches, they, they default to one position. Like your doorbell, the default position's off. And when you push the button, then the doorbell rings. But when you release it, it's off again. Okay, if that makes sense. So the default position for a doorbell is off. All right? Now, the same way with us, our default position or the natural position that we're born into is selfishness. And then there has to be a switch to where we now decide to walk selfless, which is the image and likeness of God. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important as we've been preaching this and teaching this, that uh, for the ministering to the lost, ministering to the saved, any type of ministry where you're proclaiming the gospel, that if the motive is not the love of God, even if what you're preaching is right, because your motive is wrong, it makes what's being said illegitimate. Even if it's something that is true, the spirit behind what's being said, because it is selfish, it's portraying that same selfishness in what's being said. Because whatever is behind something pushing something is the power behind it, if that makes sense. And, and uh, the example that I'll, I'll use, you can get on YouTube and look at any video that you want to of somebody preaching the gospel, and they'll, they'll have a couple of buddies out there holding signs. God hates fags. Okay? Now, even if they're saying you got to give your life to Jesus, which is true, their attitude and their motive behind what they're doing being wrong perverts what's being said. And then it makes what's being said ill-spoken of, the Scripture says. In the same way, the Scripture says that because iniquity uh, shall abound, that the love of many will wax cold. It's, it goes along with the same thing. Seeing the behavior of people preaching the gospel, not lining up with the very gospel that they're preaching, they actually preach something different. And I, I might have muddied the water a little bit. Let me say this. If you say that you're preaching the cross, but you're doing it arrogantly, and you're doing it with a wrong motive, that is not the motive that Christ had when he gave the gospel. 
And we, as the body of Christ, are to minister the gospel the same way that Christ did, both in word and in deed, in spirit and in truth. Not just proclaiming it with our mouths, but living it with our lives. And henceforth, then we have two witnesses. We have the witness of our mouth and a witness of our hands. See, because when Christ came, this is how he ministered. Not with an attitude of, I got it and you don't. You need to get like me. But when he ministered and when he gave himself for the ransom of many, he did it with the heart of God, with the, the perception of God. He was looking at it through the eyes of the Father. And consequently, that's what we're talking about when we say we're walking by faith. Instead of, and you know, the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight. What that, the breakdown of that is, meaning we don't walk by the way we see things, but by faith we view things as God sees things. That's what it means to walk by faith. That's, that's not saying, you know, that, uh, well, I'm just going to go out and do thus and so because I, and I'm just going to believe God that he's going to uh, make it happen. That's not exactly what's being said, but viewing things the way God views things, regardless of how you can see it with your natural eyes, is how you walk by faith. If in the, in the Word of God it says you have the freedom from sin, from the sin nature, from being selfish, that you have uh, power of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that you can be filled, that you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, that when you have the commandment to by love serve one another, walking in faith is seeing it God's, through God's eyes and saying, He has given this to me. He has said to go and do this, and then He has promised to back it up with power. So I'm going to walk by faith now the way that he has shown me at the cross. See, he gave us the pattern. He gave us the power. Amen? Sister Harris, you had something you wanted to add a, a moment ago when you went to the door about uh, the word flesh. I was thinking about, you know, hell is so fair. I was thinking about the prodigal son and how people, are, like you said, are getting so caught up on stuff preaching the gospel to gain or to get stuff and to um, badger and persecute other people, beating them over the head with it right. like we've been talking about. But I'm sitting here thinking, you know, without God and you're trying to get all this stuff and acquire all this stuff and you think you can come run to God, get what you want, it's kind of like I'll make a deal with you to get this and then you run off with all this <laughs> stuff. You think about the stuff of this world. You have to protect it. You have to secure it. You have to insure it. You have to make sure, you know, it's just a lot involved with trying to get your stuff. But I was thinking when you depart from God, you have no security outside of him. You know, when you choose to run off and leave God with all your stuff, right. you know, what else do you have no more protection of? The, like the Lord said, lay your treasures up in heaven. Right. You know, instead of it's just it's just crazy to me, the mindset behind it. And I said, hell is so fair because it's a garbage can. That's where all the stuff is going. You know, sure. if you, I'm just saying, if right. your motives and your study, play, it's like you're playing with God. You know, instead of having a true relationship with him and loving him for who he is. Well, sure. You know, this actually is like a garbage can. The earth is. I'm, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, I mean, this. you know what I'm saying, the mentality and the stuff behind it. Because people are getting caught up on the wrong thing instead of the love well, of God. Right. Well, and, it's, and it's, be, it's because something that was legitimate, which is trusting God. That's something that's legitimate. <laughs> I mean, that's what this is all about. And, but taking that and, and approaching it with a selfish motive. And that's, that's really what's happening. When, even when you take something that is true, like you take the scripture that says uh, that, that uh, all the riches and glory are available to us by Christ Jesus, right? That's a true statement. But if you're looking at that from your perception, which is the selfish perception, and it's all just about me getting my stuff, and now the cross just becomes a magic word to get your things, you have taken something that was legitimate and making it illegitimate. And make it, and on top of that, now it's perverted 
and it looks weird. And it's not right. And when you preach, the people can feel that something's off because the motive behind it is selfish, which is not the spirit of God. And see, the the anointing, the power behind a word is going to be uh, accompanied by the right spirit. If I can say it this way, the right spirit behind the right motive behind something is going to be accompanied by the Holy Spirit, if I can say it that way. And which goes to explain, this is a little bit off track, but how uh, there, with one person there might be a very powerful anointing with, one, with something being said, and somebody else can say the same exact thing, and there be nothing. And we always wonder why. Well, this is why, because whatever is the motivation behind it is going to determine the power behind it. Because if the motivation is selfish, no power, or only the powers of darkness. Now, if the motivation is the love of God, now you have the power of the Holy Spirit. And because the pattern has been laid down, and it is the laying down of our lives for the brethren. Something you said a moment ago, though, uh, talking about the, the, uh, the constant seeking of things. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, Let's see, I I don't want to just, I'll just read the the one verse, but verse 6 says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And it talks about, you know, as you continue down in that verse, that, uh, you know, we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and raiment let us be therefore content. But they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It says right there that content, godliness with contentment is great gain, meaning I'm content being conformed into the image and likeness of God because that is the true gain. Being like God is worth a whole lot more than all the riches of the world. And when a church would get a hold of that and they stop running after all their junk and they start looking at the image and likeness, and of course, then we have to stop and say, what is that image and likeness? It is love. That is what God's image and likeness is, the laying down of himself on our behalf, and that we walk the same way, that we talk the same way, that our speech be salted with grace, that we look at other people the same way that God views us. So when we step out to uh, get out of the car to go do whatever we have to do and we're approached with a situation or a scenario or we come upon a situation with somebody coming to say something to us, instead of reacting from our sight, our perception now should be shaped by Jesus saying, look how much I love you. And now we should view other people the same way that God has viewed us. That we, when, when we were his em- enemies, when we were at enmity with him, and our, he was, we were literally his enemy fighting against him. He didn't treat us as an enemy. But instead, he sent his only begotten son, who laid down his life willingly on our behalf, that we might live. And of course, then we see the fruit of that is one day we got saved. And then now our lives being changed, we become a benefit to society and not a drain on society. As the Word of God shaping our attitude and our motives, now we put our hand to the plow. Now when we get to the verses and when you read in uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, it said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Okay, okay. Now, are you letting the cross shape your behavior? When we see things like that, those are things that should shape our behavior. And so obviously everybody here knows we got up and we work. You you go out and you got a family. And even if you don't have a family, you still want to support the work, uh, the work of God and all the things that go with it. And so God's word nurtures positive activity. And even it's... uh, if you turn to, uh, go, to uh, go to Hebrews real quick. 
I'm going to read something real quick in Hebrews while we're right here. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. In verse 23, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So now that we have a profession of faith, since faith works by love, It says, now that you profess the right thing, let's walk in that thing. Let the thing that we're professing be the uh, pattern for our behavior now and start out by considering one another. (laughs) Because faith works by love. So we have the profession of faith, and then what follows is consider one another. And that just doesn't mean to look at the other person, but it means to consider that person's situation. Consider what that person's going through. Just like when, uh, if you have to, when you deal with people and somebody, when you, when you are, hey, how are you, or whatever, and, and they just turn around and just bite your head off for no reason. Instead of being of the same spirit, consider that they probably went through some stuff that they don't quite know how to handle. And so instead of doing like the rest of the world does and attacking back, now lay down your life. And uh, Mother Lindsay and I were talking about this. We're going to have to to bring the balance to what it means to lay down your life because we live in a time with ISIS and Islam and uh, home invaders. Now, see, we still have to be shaped by the word, right? And the word says a man that doesn't protect his family is worse than an infidel. So laying down your life doesn't mean when the enemy comes into your house to, to do whatever they desire to to your family that you just lay down and let them do whatever they want. No. See, there has to be, uh, the word has to define the word. And so what it means to lay down your life. Now, Jesus, when the scribes and the Pharisees would come up against him, he, he didn't just lay down his life whenever he wanted to. There was a time for it. Now think about that. He only went to the cross one time, and it was when the Holy Spirit said go. But it wasn't until that point. There was 150 different, probably more than that, but just even just in the Scripture, what's written down hundreds of times when when they could have taken him. And he could have laid down his life right then. But the Scripture would say that he passed through them. He hid himself and passed through them because it wasn't the time. And laying down his life didn't mean just letting them kill him whenever they wanted to. But that he had a pattern already laid out. That, he, that there was a perception that God's word gives that, when, that already trans, was transcending any kind of, uh, of thought process that he may have had. That the word of God, let me try to say it to bring it in a little closer. That God's word was his highest priority. And he followed that word. And with the dependency being upon the Holy Spirit, he was able to walk exactly as the Father in heaven deemed. And that's the same pattern that we're to hold. Yes, sir. Uh, let me get the microphone over. Okay, the, uh, you say that the laying down your life. So we are to lay down our lives when the Holy Spirit, otherwise under the God of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're talking about the, well, okay, let me say this. There's, there's a difference in laying down your physical life to die as opposed to giving up selfish precepts to take others into consideration. Oh, you saying deny yourself. Deny your selfishness. Oh. That's that's really, yeah, exactly. That's that's really laying down your own will, laying down your free will, laying down your uh, your valid defense in an argument on the behalf of considering the needs of someone else. Instead of when in the in the heat of an argument, even if you have solid foundation for what you're going to argue back if you lay that aside, even if you're right, and I know this is, this is going to be 
every situation because there's certain times when you're going to have to defend your position. But this is why it's so important that we just not only know the word, but also be led by the Holy Spirit, too, so we know which one to do. That, and and I, we're going to probably end up spending a lot more time uh, to do this, but Galatians chapter 5 and 13, what we read, it says, by love, serve one another. M- meaning it didn't just say to serve one another, but by love, by the love of God, by his perception, by viewing things and considering others at, above yourself. That being the pattern. To just uh, Luke 9.23, as we've constantly been quoting, to deny your selfishness. Take up your cross and follow him. And it's important that, and this is another thing that we're going to have to deal with in the, in the whole breakdown of this. Jesus said when he said that, to you take up your cross. Jesus didn't say to take up the cross of Christ. You take up your pattern of the cross. See, because the cross was a pattern. In the Old Testament, Moses got to pattern on Mount Sinai, the heavenly vision. Now we in the church on Mount Calvary got to pattern the same heavenly vision. And it is ultimately who God is. The pattern that Moses got for the tabernacle and the temple was a shadow of of the character of who God was. All the the different uh, pieces of furniture, all the instruments that were used in the tabernacle and then in the temple, all those things were defining the character of God, who he was, his character, his personality, and then how he would deal with us and how uh, he wanted to walk. The whole thing. What I mean, what the whole purpose of the tabernacle, what was it for? So man could walk with God. Because that was the purpose that he was created for in the first place was to walk with God. And so God got personal and said, this this was the whole point. So I'm going to make a way that we can do this. And in the mean, in in the process, it also was a revelation of his character. And that was came to ultimate fulfillment at the cross. That was the ultimate display of who he is. And who he is, is so wonderful that it covered everything. That that displaying his character in the process took care of salvation, sanctification, eternal life, everything that you ever have to have, everything that you need, all things met. It covered everything. He was all sufficient in his explanation of himself. Yes, ma'am. you look at the cross what happened he he also um what's the words for let me get the right terminology it also shows the balance of uh, him he took our punishment and think of the punishment that he took that was for us that's something we deserve it balances itself out does that make sense he's very loving but yet that there was a punishment there Okay. And yeah, you, I think kind of. I think I, I think I see what I'll you're let saying. You kinda, yeah, you're, so. you're you're saying that. L- let me just say it like this. Yeah. You're saying that love doesn't compromise. Is that what you're getting at? Right. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. That's um, and that's another misunderstanding that people are getting from this teaching. Is they're saying, well, y'all are just talking about the love of God, so you're talking about compromise. You're talking about not dealing with sin. Oh, well, on the contrary, they must not be listening with either one of their ears. Because what we're saying is actually far the opposite. Because love is far more demanding than just dealing with the outward show of your vices. And if you think about it, that's most of the highlight of a lot of people that are preaching the cross. It's just getting rid of your cigarettes, getting rid of your alcohol, getting, you know, and then we're going to talk about dealing with you know, your gossip and stuff, but we're never really going to get in and, and show you how to do that. See, so it just becomes a surface show of religiosity. And the depth of the character of God not truly being developed. Yes, ma'am. Yes, what you're saying is very good because I think what happened with us, some of uh, us Christians, we let our situation or our our, um, condition 
uh, characterize uh, how we should perceive the Lord. If we're going to take up the Lord character, we can't. <laughs> uh, our situation can't be dictated, you know, right. through our our life. But we like can't. We can't. We can't let our situation dictate how we view God. Exactly. That's because it. that's a form of selfishness. That's right exactly there. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's very very well put. That when you try to view the character of God according to your situation, you're viewing Him selfishly. And he, the, him being selfless, now you have an improper view of God. And so when you read the scripture, you're not even going to see him. He's going to be hidden from you as you try to stone him. If I can, if I can carry that through, that's what, that's what the, the situation when they were going to stone Jesus. And he said he hid himself from them and passed right before them. They were, he, he walked right in their midst and they got the rocks in their hand looking for him. And he's right there. But he was hidden. The word was hidden from him because they were viewing him selfishly. That's, that's how, thank you, that's how we miss God. We view him selfishly instead of through his perception. Not taking on the perception of God, we attempt to let our circumstance view, uh, shape our perception of God, and then now we can't see him and his word is hidden from us. Yes, brother. I was going to say, uh, uh, the perception of God that we as men and women have is actually scarred by the life that's been lived before us in, in such a way that, let's just say, fathers that aren't there and mothers that aren't there, you have no concept of, like, like let's just say yourself, a godly father, okay, which Preston would look up to, okay, he sees you as a godly father, okay, but most all, you know, and generation after generation, there is no father, and you know, a lot of times there, there's no mother, and if they are there, they're given the wrong view of what, what it means to be a father and mother, what, uh, what, what a godly, right. you know, not just a regular sure, godly, sure. Uh, uh, a father and mother, so everybody's perspective, uh, perception of Otherwise, it's locked in a box. If I say uh, you can walk on water, okay, you know, with the, the, with the Holy Spirit in you, working in you, that's possible, right? With the Holy Spirit, you know, only with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you can't walk on water, okay? You get what I'm saying? Another man would say that's impossible, but he's not looking at the fact that I said with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so are, are, you, are you saying that, that because uh, when you said that a lot of people's perception is scarred, meaning that it's, it's unchangeable then? A lot. Of, uh, not not with, with the Holy Spirit working through the person that's, that's preaching to them or teaching okay. them, not, not impossible. Okay. okay. Without that, impossible. Because okay. they, they can't see past. Which, Otherwise, they're locked right. in a box. They have, they have their God locked in a box. Which, which, is, which is why uh, all the preaching and teaching that's going forth with a selfish motive, that's why there's not being people that are set free. But the same uh, child, that no father, no mother, uh, that, that grows up in a society that's hard and cruel, <laughs> there you go. We got one in our midst. You know, exactly. Now, but what happened? Jesus said, I know your situation. I know that you've been scarred by your past, but I'm going to show you something. And he stretched out his arms and he said, no greater love hath any man than this. And at that point in time, even though you had no father, even though you had no mother, you saw what it meant to be a father. You saw what it meant to be a father. You saw what it meant to give yourself for the, the, on the behalf of someone else. That display of love that you saw on Calvary changed your life wholly and completely to the point to where you don't even remember those things in the past. That He makes yesterday go away. <laughs> that all things are new. All things today, that today we have brand new mercies. Today we have a brand new perception. That what's in the past, He said looking unto Jesus, not looking at what the things that scarred us were. That everything that we look at, the, the, the scars, it's, it's a, that's a great word that you use, the scars. When you look down and you see a scar, what you see now is healing. 
That scar, it's only just a memory to, so you can remember what God brought you through. But now there's healing that came with it. And then everything that was, that has been, that's in the past is now in the past. And now we have a new life and we have abundant life. And making the decision to walk in that, now we're living by the work of the cross. Amen? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good stuff. <laughs> oh, that everything that we were and everything that, that had, had happened to us. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what, sometimes I get to thinking about it, and, and uh, it's interesting the way that a song, you, you think about the way music has influenced this, uh, this generation, this time right now, and how a song will come on that will try to drag you back. 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And, and isn't it interesting that there was a feeling attached to that music? And as soon as that music hit, you felt that and you grew, just went cold all over because it took you to how it felt to be disconnected from the life source, to be disconnected from love and how empty you felt. But at the same time, just in that same instant, you remembered what you saw on Calvary. You saw the love that changed your life. That, that that time, that empty feeling that you had for that split second, that that was just a glimmer of the past of what you had to deal with all the time that you don't have to deal with anymore. That that, that, that new life is an abundant life when you're plugged in to the source. And, that, and walking now in love, now you can display that. Now his love is put on display in your life. That's why now we have people that are godly parents, that are, you know, men and women of God that are raising their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord because they saw Jesus, because they saw the love that was shown. And now that love shaped their lives and taught them how to be parents when they didn't know before, because I was I was one of them. I was, I was the worst among them. When uh, my poor children were just itty-bitty, I, I feel bad for them, what they had to deal with with me as a father. But I can say that I'm not, or I have not arrived, but I'm sure not what I was. I sure don't have to worry about my two-year-old now picking up a bottle of beer and handing it to me when I'm driving down the road. <laughs> Talk about messed up. I had, I had perfected messing up and then wrote new chapters. But the new way that we live, the 24th verse, and let us consider one another to provoke. Now, see, provoke here is actually a good thing. See, provoking someone in an evil way, now, that's, that's one thing, trying to get somebody mad. You know, that's what, when somebody's picking a fight. They're, they're trying to provoke. They're trying to get a rise. They're trying to get you to come down to their level. And especially if you're preaching this, there's people provoking you to try to act selfishly. That's what they're provoking you to do. They, they got their stick out and they're trying to, okay, you, the, the love of God, huh? Poke, poke, poke. And they're trying to get you to say, okay, you want to fight? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> You're too quick to say that, sister. <laughs> but, but that's what they're doing. But see, now here's what the, here's what the words say, I know. Consider that one, that person that is provoking. And let's provoke them unto love and good works. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Ready is. I'm ready I with know. the love of God for you now. I got something I to it. give you. <laughs> I should, because I think about the testimony, especially when you have a shameful life and you meet people from your past. Right, right. They're definitely the one that you're going to be a testimony on to. And the <clears throat> fact that they can say something that you knew was true yeah. and it's no longer true. Yeah. That's a serious testimony because oh, yeah. it won't oh, yeah. even shake you from the right or to the well, left. Well, and, and here's the thing, too. Now, as, as we're learning how to walk in love and what it means to be motivated now by the love of God, because that's what we're talking about. The, the laying down of our life, we got to make sure we're going to start to balance this out. That that doesn't mean just letting everybody run roughshod over you. OK, but it's taking on it's it's really walking in humility, taking on the perception of God, walking as a servant of God 
And, and now, instead of reacting to a situation according to what we want, we say, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? How would you desire that I handle this? And of course, the more word you got in you, the more vocabulary God has to speak to you in the heat of a moment. See, because if you don't have much word, he's only got a few things to say to you. But if you've got the more that you got in your mind now, he's got a big vocabulary. So when the Holy Spirit goes to speak to you, he has he can be a fluent language. I mean, a complete uh, dictionary of direction as opposed to just a few pieces here and there. See, it's more accurate the more descriptive it is. If you can give somebody the coordinates of a house, they can get to the front door. But if you just say, go down to the tree and turn left and, you know, walk about 100 feet and then turn right again. See, those are vague directions. So that's going to maybe get you in the neighborhood close, maybe, if the tree's still there. Think about that's how they used to do landmarks. Uh, the, the deed on the, my place up in Kentucky, it's like, go, to, go 50 paces to the oak tree. Okay, this deed was written hundreds of years ago. This tree's not here anymore. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, but now if you can have a GPS coordinate, you know exactly where the corner is. And so the, the word in the same way, the more that you are rich in the word, the greater of a vocabulary the Holy Spirit is going to have to speak to us as we encounter situations. The more of a word of comfort and of love we're going to have for people when we're full of the one who is comforting and loving. And look, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's people that uh, when you start talking to them uh, and, and, they've, and they've got an attitude and they're agitated and, and they're, just, they're just ready to go. I mean, that's without any other way to say it. They're just, they're just ready to go, and they're just waiting for you to say the wrong thing. But when you slow down, and let's go ahead and walk what we're preaching, and consider them. And, you know, there's, there's the hardest people to, to talk to are the ones that only want to talk about themselves. When you have a conversation, it's all just, okay, I did this and this and this and this. And it's just all about them. And, it, and that's all they talk about. You, that is really hard. And, and unfortunately, when you deal with people in the world, that's, that's what it is. And you walked up, hey, what's going on? And you op- you've done open the door now. It's, it's all over. They, they, got, they got hours worth of stuff they want to talk about about them. But when, when it's approached now with, with the right mindset of, you know, let's consider this person and what they're going through, and when they see, and they will, if your motive is truly the way that God loved me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk that same way. The, the, when, when I was an enemy of God, I'm going to now walk that same way. And people who I consider to be my enemy, they're going to be coming to me to ask for prayer. Because they're going to see my life as a living testimony, a living epistle that is preaching the word of God, that their life is preaching the cross with them out, without even them opening their mouth. And so your enemies are going to be coming to your gates for prayer in their time of need. And so don't you dare shut them out when they come and say, I need something. I need prayer. I need to talk to you. Because they're going to see it in your life, even if they won't hear it from your mouth. And the same spirit that's it's in you, which was in Christ Jesus, the same motive of love that was in Christ Jesus, when they see that in action, it's going to speak volumes. Volumes of the book. And so God, then the people now are getting a true revelation of Jesus Christ in us. Not just a not just in terminology, but in true faith working by love. Having two witnesses, our behavior matching our profession. Because when we're when we see and view and perceive the love of God as what we've been going in 1 John 3.16, just as Christ has laid down his life for us, so should we lay down our life for the brethren. When we can start to walk in that 
And that now becomes our perception. And we're not viewing things selfishly. We don't get offended so easily either. Think about it. The, the, the selfishness is what puts us on defense all the time. But selflessness puts us on the offense. Because you never score any points playing defense. You're only going to score on the offense, right? If, and and what, I, what I mean by that, if you're only out there defending your position, you're never going to go anywhere. You're never going to make any progress, and you're never going to score any points. But the ones that are just constantly on offense, not over here focusing on everybody and how they're doing it wrong and trying to get them to, hey, I'm doing it right, you do it like me, but lead by example. Don't worry about, I mean, you can only talk to some people so long, their ears are shut. I mean, just like the Pharisees that, you know, the word was hidden from them in their midst to where he passed right through them. They're looking for him with rocks in their hand, and he's right there, and they can't see him. The word, there's a lot of people that that's how it is. You can talk to them, and you can tell the word is hidden from them because they're perceiving it selfishly. And that's why Jesus said the first step in coming to him is denying your selfishness. Denying your selfish precept. Denying your selfish perception. Take up a selfless perception. Follow me. Follow me. Follow this pattern that I've laid down. But you can only get to following the pattern when you deal with selfishness and you change your perception to selfless. Then that's the only time that you're now equipped to follow him. That's why it says, by love, serve one another. Amen? Um, one other thing that I wanted to read while we're here, because we're going to start trying to... <clears throat> trying to tie this in, and uh, Pastor and I were talking about this earlier, and this verse is one that I had I had, had uh, written down to, to go over so many times, and I've never gotten to it. Um, 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'm glad that, uh, that Pastor Harris reminded me of it today, but we're going to try to start moving towards this platform and deal a little more specifically with what this means. But the highlight of what's being said here, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Amen. He said, above all things, have love among yourselves. And love... That word love, of course, it's, it's uh, translated charity, but it's the word agape. And it's the love of God. His definition of love, not ours. His definition of giving yourself on the behalf of another. His definition of considering one another. His definition of how to deny what you desire and take upon the desires of another. Um, but we, we don't want to spend too much time there, but that's going to be the direction that we're going to try to go the next time. Uh, I'm not for sure, maybe next Wednesday, if Brother Jeff might be coming up again, but, uh, but either way, we're going to continue in this same direction. Um, is there any other questions or any comments that anybody would like to make before we close out? <coughs> When we, um, when we talk about the love of God also and um, to love the brethren and the character of uh, Jesus also was uh, love, joy, peace, humble, um, experience, <coughs> all those things uh, should be shown in us, even if we come across a brother that is not so... Um, Godly. Yeah. You're, but those things that those characters, if we have the character of Christ, 
the characters, the character. Characteristics? Yeah, characteristics that I'm right. talking about. You're talking Should about Galatians 5 and 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, right, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against yes. such there is no law. Yes, that's it. And this should be shown in us. And therefore, that is, a, that is one of the ways how we shall love to one another, by being patient. Sure. With the um, well, patient. Right. Well, yeah, look, and, and if you look at that list, every one of those attributes is for somebody else. I mean... <laughs> You know, you, you you can't be gentle to yourself. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> but you know what I'm, you see what I'm saying, though, when you look at that list, all those things um, are for someone else's behalf. Whereas if you, if you go up to uh, verse 19, which are the works of the flesh or the works of selfishness, Every one of those things deal with things that are selfish, pleasing yourself and not caring about the needs of someone else. Amen. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll close out right there then. And uh, I pray that you all have uh, enjoyed this this evening, that you've maybe uh, gained something from it. And praise the Lord. This continue to uh, stay in this great word that the Lord has given us and stay steadfast with it regardless of the opposition and regardless of, of who likes it and who doesn't. Amen. Uh, and we're going to just continue going forward and uh, thank the Lord for every day that he gives us. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. All right, brother. All right. Well, I'll be uh, back next Wednesday then. And uh, I hope that all of you are too. If you will, let's go ahead and we'll close out in prayer and Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your great love. Lord, for your love is great. We thank you for your tender mercies, Lord, for your loving kindness and your compassion that you had on us. Even when we were your enemies, Lord, how that you loved us. Lord, we thank you for that expression of love that you gave us on Calvary. And it was so much more, Lord, than just what we received, but it was a pattern on how to live. And Lord, it was the expression of your character and how that you've taught us who you are in that great work. Father, we just ask that you have your way in the hearts and the lives of these, your great people, Lord, and that you would bring us all together Sunday, Lord, to worship in spirit and in truth for all those that are on the road, Lord, that you keep them and just talk to them, Lord, and walk with them. And for all those that have turned away, Lord, that you bring them back, Lord, that you would comfort everyone that's going through a trial and a tribulation, Lord, as you are the God of all comfort. And Lord, we ask that you would just have your way in this ministry, Lord, in the radio teachings, Lord, and for all that you've desired for us to do, Lord, help us to be faithful and to walk in it. And Lord, we just ask that you have your way, Lord, and help us in all that we say and all that we do, Lord, that we might glorify you and that we might be living epistles, Lord, and testimonies of your grace and your mercy. And we ask and pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.